All righty, let's get the show on the road. Hello, everyone. My name is Armand. I'm a member of the Youth Leadership Council at Earth Echo International. And we are so excited to have students from all over the globe joining us right here as we celebrate World Oceans Day and learn about our national parks. Earth Echo International is a global nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change our planet. Now, reaching more than over 2 million people in 146 countries, we provide free original content, immersive experiences, and trusted resources to power young people to become leaders and problem solvers in their communities and around the world. Now, also a reminder that you can send in questions for our host today, and we will break throughout today's presentation to address them. So feel free to start typing questions in the chat space on YouTube or in the Zoom Q&A feature. Now, I'd love to introduce some amazing people from the National Park Service System. Gary and Maria. As a boy growing up in South Florida, Gary Bremen's parents instilled in him an insatiable wanderlust fueled by equally insatiable curiosity. They took him to places with names like Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Carlsbad, and in doing so, set him on a career path as a national park ranger. Now, 34 years into that career, with almost 25 years of that being in Biscayne National Park, he still finds enormous satisfaction in discovering the lesser known aspects of the world around him. He is a writer, a speaker, and a storyteller whose work has appeared in national magazines, on television, radio, and even podcasts. He is the recipient of the National Park Service Freeman Tilden Award for Excellence in Interpretation and even the Crystal Owl Award for Training Excellence, as well as a special award from the United States Coral Reef Task Force for his efforts to educate South Floridians about the park and its inhabitants. Now, Maria, she has lived in the greater Mi Miami area her entire life. There is no place Maria likes to explore more than the seashore itself. Maria loves to scour the sargasm rack line for sea life of remnants of it, or even remnants of it, sorry. She receives a great sense of place from the sea. At age eight, she went on her own first camping trip in the Florida Keys. Her family camping trips helped solidify her love for the outdoors. Now, Maria has made a career of teaching children through nature play and exploration. She has worked for almost 20 years at the Biscayne National Park. Over the years, Maria has explored the mangrove shoreline, rack line, and camped on the ancient coral island of Biscayne with thousands of children. She's now interested in learning the science behind why nature is so important to our well-being. She lives south of Miami with her three children, husband, and even chickens. When she is not working at connecting children in the park, she is connecting her own children to nature through being outside. And without further ado, Maria and Gary, please take it away. Hi everybody. This is uh, this is Ranger Gary from Biscayne National Park, and uh, super excited to be here. Thanks for the introductions, Armand. And uh, Maria and I are, of course, like a lot of people working from home. So we have uh, we have virtual backgrounds with us. I've got my sparkling water that I love so much, and Maria's got some mangroves behind her. There, we are going to start off with. Uh, with a, a look at, um, oops, something just happened to my screen here. Hold on, sorry. Mm -hmm. There we go, okay. Um, I'm gonna start off with a look at uh, marine protected areas around, around the world. So the ocean covers about 70% of the planet, right? And we have this tendency to, to say things like the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, but of course, what today is all about, World Oceans Day, is this, this is really one big ocean, and you can see that on the map. It's all connected. Now, those colored blobs are marine protected areas, areas that are protected in some way by some government entity somewhere. There are about 11,000 of them all around the world, but most of them are really small, less than 10K square which is helpful on a local level, for sure, makes better fishing in a certain local area perhaps, but it doesn't do a whole lot on a large scale when the ocean is so big. And less than 10% of the ocean is protected in marine protected areas. And scientists believe that 
it really should be about 30% if we're going to be effective at that. So I wanted to go through and, and talk about a, a few of these marine protected areas. And we'll start with some that a lot of people will know right off. Galapagos Marine Reserve, um, down off the coast of Ecuador, enormous pelagic fish, the ones that spend time out in the ocean. We have some pictures here of, of great hammerheads and a whale shark and a mola mola, ocean sunfish. Some of these animals I've never seen. I have seen um, hammerheads in the park, not in this kind of number that we're seeing here where there's at least 30 or 40 in that picture. But uh, whale sharks and mola mola, things that I hope to see someday. And the Galapagos Marine Reserve is about 35 million acres. Enormous, right? Let's move a little bit further and uh, see what else we can find. An another one that a lot of people really know is uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And that's even bigger, 85 million acres. And I think this one's probably so popular because it was one of the earliest ones. It's also been super popularized in movies like Finding Nemo, right? So we have some pictures of, uh, of clownfish and giant clams. And I was fortunate enough to go diving on the Great Barrier Reef back in 2001. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's actually the size of Italy, Germany, or Japan. Absolutely huge. 85 million acres. Um, let's continue to another one that I think a fair number of people know, and that is uh, Palau National Marine Sanctuary, 123 million acres. And this one is, is interesting because the, the local people have for, for centuries put bans on certain types of fisheries there um, in a practice called, and I think it's pronounced bull, B-U-L. And a local chieftain will say, nope, we're not catching enough of this. We got to stop catching that right now. Let them grow up. And this is a really brilliant way to manage marine resources. And uh, that is where marine protected areas come from. But, but Palau has been doing it forever and ever because no-take zones have proven effective in so many places around the world. Um, this is my probably my favorite because of the name, um, and I, I'm going to really try and pronounce it right. It's Papa Hanau Moku Akea, I think, um, and it's really big, 373 million acres. And this is uh, the United States did this, and uh, that's pretty awesome. It's relatively new. It's operated by NOAA, National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, state of Hawaii, um, 373 million acres. And believe it or not, that is not the largest marine protected area in the world. The largest one is the Ross Sea protected area down off of Antarctica, mostly protected by um, New Zealand, but uh, uh, declared by a, a consortium of 24 countries. And it's where you're going to find orcas and, and penguins and gigantic icebergs and just a really extraordinary looking area. And again, one that I would definitely hope to visit sometime in the future. So these are a few of the really big marine protected areas around the world. In the United States, um, we have a pretty good variety of ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes national parks. Um, and they are scattered, of course, along the coasts, the, the four coasts of the United States, as some people like to say, the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Gulf, and the Great Lakes coast. Total of 88 different national parks in 23 states, two and a half million water acres, 89 million visitors a year. And, and that sounds like a lot, but when you put it in the context of some of those really huge marine protected areas we just talked about, what, what we have protected is, is great, but it's not nearly enough. So I want to take you on a little tour because this is what I really love is national parks. I want to take you on a tour of a few of these ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes national parks. And the first one may surprise the heck out of you, and I only added this in about... 20 minutes before we went online because today being World Oceans Day, national parks and other places are posting about um, World Oceans Day. 
And what national park did I see put up a special video today was Arches National Park, which I thought was awesome. I encourage you to go check it out on their Facebook page. And uh, Arches was indeed an ocean. It was just about 300 million years ago. And uh, they're playing off of that with some fossils, and that's really terrific. So check them out. Lots of national parks are, uh, are former ocean parks. Let's go into some that are more current here. So we'll start up in the Northwest. One of my favorites, Glacier Bay National Park. This is a, as the name would imply, a bay that was carved out by glaciers, many, many glaciers out there. And uh, I've got a picture of one of those little inlets with a glacier at the end there. Um, the wildlife here is spectacular. You've got sea otters, you've got, uh, sea stars. I personally, living on the, the southwest or the southeast coast of the United States, we don't get kelp here and I love algae. So having kelp and algae that you can stretch out in your arms is pretty cool. So that's me up at Glacier Bay there. And, and I want to share one experience that I had with you um, two summers ago at Glacier Bay. I'm going to bring up this next video. Um, I actually filmed this and I was on a boat and it was just kind of random filming. I had heard some cracking in the background and watch right in the center there. You start to see some of that fall off and then that enormous chunk of ice falls off. And I did a little bit of calculating based on, on what the ranger there told me was the size of that glacier front. And it's about the size of a 50-story building and a couple blocks long that fell off there. And that sounds ridiculously cool. And I got to tell you, I was, I was just beside myself excited until I realized what that means. Because that was not the only time that day we saw a big chunk of ice fall off. Glaciers are melting at a very fast rate, faster than they've ever done at any time in uh, in human history for sure and even before humans were around and that of course is a sign of, of warming planet and global climate change and so it's pretty sad from that but I was I was still excited to witness that. Let's go from Alaska to someplace a little bit warmer the National Park of American Samoa and uh, this is the remote the most remote of our national parks um, beaches and mountains and coral reefs and that little critter up in the corner. Some of you may have seen recently, We've there's a new quarter that just came out a few weeks ago and uh, that quarter has that animal on it. That's a Samoan fruit bat. It's the most adorable quarter you'll ever see. So look for it when you go to the grocery store. Um, but these bats are, are huge. They're like cat size. They're enormous and so cute. So National Park of American Samoa. Let's come back to the Florida mainland and we'll start in California. Not all of the marine areas in the national parks are about nature. Um, humans have been exploring the oceans to various degrees ever since humans were by the ocean. And uh, San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park gives you an opportunity to experience some of those ships. They actually have a collection of seven historic ships, including the 1881 square rig ship that's in my picture there called the Valclutha. And in uh, and, and the lower right corner there, there's a, um, there's a picture of sailing on one of those historic ships, one of those hidden gems that you find when you travel. If you're ever in, in San Francisco, especially in the fall when the weather is great, try and get out on a trip on the scow schooner Alma from 1891. You get to help raise the sails and the anchors and all that kind of stuff, super fun. Let's move inland to a park that I used to work at, um, up at the southern end of Lake Michigan. This is Indiana Dunes National Park, and it was Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore until uh, just a couple years ago, so national parks do change their names periodically. There are four national lake shores, one national park, and a whole bunch of historic sites all around the Great Lakes. And so while we might not consider them marine, 
because they don't have salt in them. The, uh, the Great Lakes are certainly resources, and, and sitting at the edge of a Great Lake, if, if you're not used to the ocean and you don't mind missing the smell, you can almost convince yourself that you're at an ocean there anyway. This is just outside Chicago, right in between the steel mills and a nuclear plant. It looks to be not great, but if you look at things up close, it's got an extremely high biological diversity. Moving on to uh, Maine, all the way up north, we have Acadia National Park, and this is another of my favorites. It's kind of like the, the first, it's the first national park in the east, and it's the, the perfect combination of mountains and the sea. It's got tide pools. It's got one of my favorite beaches anywhere, not because I like to lay on a beach, but because of the sand at Green Beach, Green Sand Beach is just gorgeous. It's mostly tiny little spines from sea urchins mixed with all kinds of other stuff and it gives it this greenish hue. It's the prettiest sand I've ever seen. And great hiking up above the ocean. Where can you hike mountains and cling to the face of a rock and look at the ocean at the same time? That's the Beehive Trail over there on the right hand side. So Acadia National Park up in Maine is a great one. Um, Cape Cod National Seashore, one of the first, actually the first national seashore, is up in Massachusetts. It's got a lot of great history associated with it, as well as nature, because this is where the pilgrims first landed. And um, this is also where my friend that you're going to hear from in just a little bit here, Ranger Maria, wanted to go. I don't know, are you going to tell that story, Maria? I, I can when we get okay. to it, if you like. Yeah, I would love for you to tell that story because it's one of my favorites. So I'm going to leave that for her. But um, Cape mm -hmm. Cod plays an important role in Maria's history as a national park ranger. I, for uh, one, am definitely interested in hearing that story, Maria. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's move. Um, we're going to kind of totally skip Florida now, and we're going to go from... Uh, from Cape Cod down to Virgin Islands National Park, because we actually have six national parks in the Caribbean, five of those in the Virgin Islands, mostly on St. Croix, but Virgin Islands National Park is the largest, and it is on the island of St. John. Again, really gorgeous, um, volcanic origins, mountains meeting the ocean with the that classic tropical blue water with sea turtles and um, the ruins of sugar mills, so there's a lot of, of sad history in the Virgin Islands there as well with the uh, slave trade. And uh, so um, a lot to learn at Virgin Islands National Park and, and other national parks in the air, plus the coral reefs right offshore too. All right, come back to the Florida mainland, and we'll touch on a, a national park that lots of people know about. It is the... Uh, the third largest national park in the lower 48 states with 1.2 million acres, so enormous. And Everglades National Park is the largest subtropical wilderness east of the Mississippi. So it's a, a really great mix of freshwater meeting saltwater, the classic estuary over a very long distance. And um, it's a river of grass and incredibly diverse and diverse, incredibly endangered because of so many of us living here in South Florida. And not just about the ocean, there are pinelands, there are gators, there are crocodiles. It's the only place in the world, South Florida, where you'll find both alligators and crocodiles coexisting. Orchids and butterflies and tree islands and a, a really extraordinary place and a, a good one to explore at any time of year if you don't mind mosquitoes. If you do mind mosquitoes, you want to go in the winter because this time of year, they're pretty horrific over there right now. Moving on, a little bit south of Everglades National Park is Dry Tortugas National Park. It used to be Fort Jefferson National Monument because of a great big fort. It's actually the largest brick fortification in the Western world there. And it was a Union fort during the Civil War. It never saw battle, but was used as a prison. And today it's kind of the centerpiece of this 56,000 acre national park that has just seven tiny little islands on it. A couple of lighthouses, great snorkeling, very remote. You can't drive there. You have to take a boat about 56 mi uh, 68 miles, sorry, 68 miles past Key West to get out there. 
You can also take a seaplane out. But um, this is on a lot of people's bucket lists if they are National Park fans and travelers because it's such a, an amazing place. And I'm going to come to the end of my little tour here with the park that, if I'm being completely honest, is my absolute favorite. And I, I, I feel like I can say that because I've been to 252 out of the 419 national parks. Um, and, and this one really is my favorite. I have some close runners up, but this is the one that I've spent most of my life at. And uh, it is an extraordinary place. Biscayne National Park, Maria is going to go into a whole lot more detail on it here in just a second. But um, I was wondering if we had any questions about national parks in general. Anything coming in from uh, virtual world out there? Yeah, let me go ahead and take a look. I know there are plenty of people participating in today's virtual event. Just once again, thank you everyone for joining us in today's virtual event here for World Oceans Day. We're here with some awesome National Park Service members and awesome rangers. And all fascinating, you said 252 out of how many National Parks? Out of 419 is what I've been to. That is it would have been higher if it weren't for this amount. pandemic, you know? <laughs> how many did you plan on uh, going to during these, oh, these times? Oh, I, I missed out on going to six new ones when, uh, when I didn't get to go to New York City last month, so... Gotcha. All right. Let me check to see if we got any questions coming in. Um, Yasmin like, would like to say hi to Gary. <laughs> Yasmin. Hi, Yasmin. And then we do have one question. Everyone's kind of wanting to know, what would be your recommendation for somebody that hasn't visited a national park yet? Where should they visit first? Well, that is... I would say, you know, go to the one that's closest to your home. And no matter where you live, there are national parks close by. It's not all about, I know we all tend to emphasize the million acre this and the 150,000 acre that, but there are national parks all over. Armand, where, where do you live? You're in uh, Corpus Christi? Yes, that's correct. I think the closest one to me, or not that I think, I know for sure because I visit there often, is going to be the South Padre Island National Seashore. There you go. Padre Island National Seashore. You also have Palo Alto Battlefield, not too far away. And uh, a lot of people forget the little tiny parks like that, too. <laughs> so no matter where you are, even in big cities, you know, the Statue of Liberty, we had it up on the screen for a little bit there. Statue of mm -hmm. Liberty is a national park. Um, and, and so many other really famous landmarks are national parks, the homes of great Americans, the homes of presidents. And, you know, not, not to to be um, drag things down, but national parks also protect stories of where we as a nation have really made mistakes. And um, so that includes, you know, places like Selma, Alabama, where people were beaten on a bridge for protesting for their rights. That includes um, the internment camps mm -hmm. in places like California and, um, and Idaho, where, uh, where American citizens were, were kind of taken away from their homes because they shared something in common with somebody that did something bad to our country. And, and we hope, and this is hard to remember sometimes, but we hope that, you know, these places teach us a lesson. And, um, and you know, I, that's hard to say right now. Well, thank you so much for saying that, Gary. It is a very good point to point out that all of our national parks, they have a lot of environmental um, you know, factors to it, right? Mean so much importance to our environment and worldwide, that's why we're protecting them. But also there's a lot of historical significance in a lot of parks as well. So thank you for making that a point. And I know for a fact that almost all national park services um, and programs, they have a lot of things in place to learn about those historical significant events. So thank you for pointing that out, Gary. Absolutely. And more than half the national parks are free, too. They're generally pretty cheap. You know, a family of, of five can spend a week for, for 50 bucks in some of the biggest, most expensive ones, but most of them are free. So it's a great way to get out and, uh, and do some cool stuff. Not everything's going to be open right now because of this pandemic, but uh, slowly we're opening things up. So I'll shut up now and let Maria talk.
<laughs> well, right before we go slide over and segue into Maria, I do have one question. It's really amazing being able to visit all these national parks and you see, you get to see so many different types of species, but somebody would like to know, and, and Maria, you're more than welcome to kind of um, jump in on this to kind of segue into your portion here. Um, but they want to know, what is your favorite species to see at the Biscayne National Park? Oh boy, there are so many um, species. I'll tell you what my my favorite uh, animal of all time is, and that I'll get that story in um, that um, Gary was mentioning when I went to Cape Cod. But um, I grew up um, as many little girls and boys um, infatuated with uh, dolphins and whales. And I saw a movie when I was little um, called Splash. And that movie had a, a, a mermaid in it, and it was um, it set in Cape Cod at the beginning of the movie. So I wanted to um, go up to see um, a mermaid. So I went to Cape Cod as a full grown adult, not really expecting to see mermaids, but I had that, you know, that desire to see that, that water. And I ended up seeing um, whales for the first time in, in the wild and it was magnificent. And um, that is my all time favorite animal that you get to see in national parks. In Biscayne, there's another uh, marine mammal that is almost as much fun to see and that's the Florida manatee. And they are um, just very interesting creatures, um, very bulbous and they have whiskers and they like to feel around with their prehensile mouth. Um, so they're very fun to watch. Thank you so much, Maria. You are more than welcome to take the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So we are going to look a little bit more closely at Biscayne National Park now. And Biscayne National Park is actually located um, just south of downtown Miami. And it was established to protect four interdependent ecosystems. And those are the mangrove shoreline, the seagrass meadows of Biscayne Bay, the northernmost Florida Keys, and then the northernmost part of the Florida reef track. So let's take a look at those mangroves, shall we? So mangroves actually occur all over the world. In Biscayne, we have three true mangroves, the black, the white, and the red mangrove. The red mangrove is the one that's kind of um, famously known with its prop roots. You can see it here in the picture. It's the one that extends closest to the water. It looks like it's walking out into the water and sometimes called the walking tree. Um, you can see that it creates a habitat both underwater in between its prop roots and then also above the water and its branches. And there are actually over 50 mangroves um, all around the world and with its kind of cousins and friends that live in the same area, there's actually over 80 um, types of trees that live in these salty conditions. They provide shelter for countless animals. They're the basis of the food um, chain, both in Biscayne and in other parts where they occur. They protect the shorelines in, um, in two ways. They protect um, the, the water, the coastal water from runoff and even larger pieces of, of garbage that can be um, caught in the mangroves as they act as a buffer. And then they can also um, protect the the, in, the the mainland and inland communities um, from here in South Florida from hurricanes and then other parts of the world from tsunamis. So they're very important in that aspect, just holding down that, that shoreline. And then one of the most fascinating things that mangroves do for us is that they are, um, they mitigate climate change. They um, actually pound for pound can um, store four times the amount of carbon than the rainforest. So they're just quite a powerhouse when it comes to um, being a carbon sink. Do we have any questions so far? All righty, let's see if we got some questions, Kim, people. Let's see, it says, what can people do who don't live near mangrove habitats do to protect them? 
That's a great question. And um, we were going to get that to, to a little bit later, but I can stick it in mm -hmm. right now. And um, there's this saying, right? All drains live, uh, um, drain out to the ocean or lead to the ocean. Um, so wherever we are, we can be really um, um, wise about our water and what we let into the water where there, there's uh, fertilizers on our lawn, um, pesticides in our food, um, those things, we, we need to be careful wherever we are. And that will protect, um, help protect the mangroves um, and just the coastal communities um, throughout. Yeah, that's actually completely correct. I mean, especially, you know, it's so easy for us to just pour any type of liquid in our drains or in the bathtubs or simply outside whenever we're trying to do stuff with our lawn. But we also have to be a little bit more um, mindful and conscientious about what we do put in those drains, because just like Maria said, those go straight into the ocean and what lives in the oceans are happy little friends and we don't want anything to happen to our happy little friends. Now, Maria, you did mention that there are a couple of different types of uh, species of mangrove. Um, somebody wants to know for Maria and Gary, what are y'all's types of favorite uh, species of mangroves? So um, the, the um, red mangrove, the one actually behind me here in the photo, um, it's just a warrior, you know, it's just there on the shore. There's wind coming, there's wave action. Um, there's the, the, the change of the tide, which um, exposes the, the mangrove to a lot of heat and sun, and then the tide comes in and it's underwater. So I just love how tough it is. Thank you, Maria. And what about yourself, Gary? Do you have a specific favorite? Well, yeah, it, it's the same. The, the mangrove forest in general is, is pretty cool, but the red mangroves are the most distinctive. And, um, you know, I, I love them so much, I decided that I was going to get married in the mangroves. <laughs> so um, we were married on paddle boards in the mangroves with that lady in the funny hat there performing the ceremony. So um, it's a pretty extraordinary <laughs> place for me, too. Well, we definitely appreciate you, Gary, as well as the lady in the funny hat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I, I think this would be a good po um, moment to go ahead and switch over to talking about seagrass. Absolutely. Um, seagrasses, they're another kind of acquired taste. When we, when we have visitors that visit Biscayne National Park, they want to see the, the glitz and glamour of the coral reef, the bright colors, the big fish. Um, but the seagrass in itself, just like the mangroves, has its own subtle beauty. Um, and in Biscayne National Park, we have a lot of turtle grass, a lot of manatee grass, um, some shoal grass, and they can be found in, in shallow, brackish, or salty water um, throughout the world, different species of seagrasses, that is. And that can be anywhere from the tropics, actually, all the way to the Arctic Circle. Um, and some folks get confused um, when we walk out into the beaches here. They're like, oh, there's seaweed growth. It's not quite a seaweed. Um, it is a flowering plant. It's much more um, sophisticated um, than a seaweed. No offense, I love seaweed too. Um, they, the seagrasses, they do produce oxygen. It's very important to our water. They absorb nutrients, which a lot of times as people and children, we want lots of nutrients, right? We wanna eat nutrients dense food, but in marine ecosystems, it's a little different. And nutrients sometimes when they're too high, they can be a bad thing because they can produce algae blooms, for example. Um, so it's a great thing that the seagrasses absorb nutrients. The root system of the seagrasses help to maintain the sediment in place, the sand, which is great. And then one of the things that I love to teach about the most is the incredible food web that depends on, on the seagrasses. And there are invertebrates and algae, and then small fish and juvenile fish of larger species. And then there's sponges and mollusks and mammals and reptiles. All of these things depend on the seagrasses either for shelter or for food. And a single acre of seagrass can actually support upwards of 40,000 fish 
and 50 million small invertebrates. So they are highly productive um, ecosystems, both in Biscayne National Park and other parts of the world. Any questions about the seagrasses? Oh, wow, that is spectacular. I love to learn about, you know, intertidal and tidal zones, but learning about, you know, the seagrasses and the different seagrass nurseries is amazing because a lot of people don't realize how, um, you know, impactful those areas of the ocean are just all the way down on the bottom and how important they are to the vitality of the life down there. So let's see, I know we've got a couple of questions come, coming in. It seems like Somebody would like to know what eats um, the seagrams and seagrams and seagrass. Sorry about that. What it what eats the seagram? Yes. Great. So um, my friend the manatee that I mentioned earlier, they can eat about ten percent of their body weight in seagrass every day. Um, so they eat seagrass, and then um, the um, the green sea turtles eat seagrass. Um, but those are the megafauna, the love, the ones that we love to talk about. But there are other animals that eat the seagrass as well, um, small, um, smaller objects. I'm sorry, smaller animals. But I'm going to tag team Gary in because he might want to share a little bit about the epiphytes that are found on seagrasses. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things about seagrasses. When you look at a picture of, of seagrasses, you know, it's not like a blade of grass in your lawn that's nice and smooth and pure and green. It's got all kinds of little things living on it. And um, these are epiphytes. They're usually not causing a whole lot of trouble for these animals, sometimes when the algae gets too thick. But if you look at some of the, the blades of seagrass in this background picture, you'll see there's kind of like a white crustiness <laughs> on some of those. And then if you look at the picture in the, oh, there's a pointer. In the upper left, um, you can see that seagrass beds are not just seagrasses. There's all types of algae in there. That thing that looks like a little tiny toadstool or a wine glass is the mermaid's wine glass algae. So there's a huge diversity in there. And when an animal goes in and eats seagrass, we talk about, for example, manatees being vegetarians. They eat seagrass. But do you think they're scraping off all that stuff off of every blade of seagrass? They're, they're not. They're eating all of that stuff, too. And the way I like to describe it, if, if you were to say that you were going to eat nothing but salad for the rest of your life, you would be eating an awful lot of lettuce. But that's boring, and it's not very nutritional. What makes a salad nutritional is all that extra good stuff that you put in. All the little crunchy bits, the carrots, the seeds, the nuts, the dressing, the tomatoes. And think of those epiphytes that live on the blades of seagrass as all the crunchy bits. And that's where most of the nutritional value for seagrass comes from for animals like sea turtles and whatnot. So if someone says, like Maria alluded to earlier, oh, seagrass, gross, yuck. Um, but they love sea turtles and they love manatees. You know, it's, it's all connected here, right? <laughs> you can't separate one without the other. So, um, yeah, that's one of my favorite cool things about seagrasses. Wow. So manatees and sea turtles really do have kind of a variety of salad going down at the bottom Indeed. of the ocean floor, don't they? <laughs> well, uh, are there any types of seagrasses over in the Florida Keys? This would be a good segue into the next topic here. So oh, yeah, absolutely. When you go across Biscayne Bay and across the seagrass um, meadows, you get to um, the Florida Keys. And we in Biscayne National Park protect the northernmost of the Florida Keys. And um, these are actually ancient coral reefs. Um, about 100,000 years ago, the sea level was 100 feet higher and those um, islands were underwater. Hmm, let me double check. Let me phone the friend. Ranger Gary, did I go too high on my feet? Oh, how many did you say? I said 100. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Okay, thanks friend. I'm um, just double checking my facts here. They've stored for such a long time that sometimes I question myself. 
So you can see these islands in, these, in the pictures that you have, and you can see how densely vegetated they are. They are vegetated or covered with a tropical hardwood hammock. And that's the closest thing to a forest that we have in South Florida. The trees don't get very high like in different parts of the country um, because we have hurricanes here. So our trees every, you know, few years or few decades, they get trimmed, um, but they're made for that. So don't feel too bad. They have ways to come back um, very, very easily after a few years um, because um, they're made for hurricanes. So the gumbo limbo would be a perfect example. It's a tree that we have down here and it can grow a new tree from a branch. Um, let me make sure that I'm not. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share about the islands that's, that's unique is that we have some endemic species that are found nowhere else, including the shell swallowtail butterfly and the semaphore cactus. And that's something that I find very interesting about um, islands in general in different parts of the world. And, and also just, just oh, as yeah. a, a quickie, you know, National Park, Biscayne National Park was not set aside to protect a butterfly that lives in only one place in the world, nor was it set aside to protect this cactus, which is only there's two populations in the whole world. But when you protect the large area, um, you, you in, in undoubtedly get all those other things in too. So, you know, we were talking about marine protected areas and, and marine ecosystems being so incredibly diverse. You're, you're protecting lots of stuff that you don't even know is there, might not even have a name yet. And that's the value of protecting large areas. Mm, absolutely. And that's something specific from the national parks is not Gary, that instead of um, creating a protected area for a particular species, like some other agencies, we protect whole ecosystems. Right. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you may see like the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge or the Great White Heron National Wildlife Refuge. And those are really set aside to focus on a specific species. They're not going to ignore the others, but it was really set aside for that. We have a different philosophy in the National Park Service, protect a very large area and, and manage it so that everything gets protected. Absolutely. I love that. You guys have some amazing stories. So we really appreciate y'all's perspectives on giving us a virtual tour of these amazing national um, parks as well. So I do have a, a question for our Florida Keys discussion that we just had. And somebody would like to know how many keys make up the Florida Keys? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> A lot, you know, and, and then you have to decide what's a key. Is a, is a mangrove tree that has a little bit of dirt gathering around <laughs> its base, is that an island or is that a mangrove tree? So, you know, there's a lot of semantics in there. And there are some people who say Biscayne National Park has 33 keys. And, you know, I defy them. They, they can look at any map and try and count out 33 and tell me what is a key and what isn't. So I say about 50. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, it's really hard to to decide what a key is. Gotcha. All righty, that is that is something interesting to think about. I don't think a lot of people um, put in a lot of like logistic efforts into deciding what technically is an, an island. Just like you had mentioned, Gary talking right. about mangroves. Um, and then I, I do have a personal question for you guys. Um, I do plan on going here myself someday, and I would love to know what are some of your favorite spots. To kind of take everything in at. You go ahead, for, Gary. Well, my my favorite spot in the park is is we've already seen pictures of it. That area surrounded by mangroves, Jones Lagoon. Um, uh, and if you put that slide up that says Florida Keys, that's Jones Lagoon from the air. That's that's Jones Lagoon there. That. Wow. extremely shallow body of water off to the right hand side there it's just filled with tiny little again are those islands are those keys are those trees <laughs> um but i went there just last week i i hadn't been out in two and a half months and mm. um you know it was it's just good for the soul to to be out there and see the bottom covered in upside down jellyfish and sharks swimming by it's it's an amazing place so definitely definitely jones lagoon for me 
Well, you had me at jellyfish. They are absolutely my favorite thing. As a matter of fact, when I was going into college, I wanted to do marine biology and be a... Uh-oh, I lost Starmon there. Uh-oh, looks like we might have lost Armand. Armand, can you? Armand. All right. Well, while we wait for Armand to try and reconnect. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline. I'm Expeditions Manager at Earth Echo. Oh, Armand, do we have you back? Can you hear me? There oh, we go. There we didn't okay. hear what you were saying about your love for jellyfish. Would you repeat for us? Yeah, absolutely. I was just mentioning that um, going into college, I originally wanted to be a marine biologist to study jellyfish. And so I was saying that, Gary, you had me at jellyfish. Upside down jelly is <laughs> my favorite. They are super cool. Maria, what's your favorite part? Oh, my goodness. Um, it's hard to pick one part of the park, um, but I've spent a lot of time on Elliott Key. And as um, Armand mentioned um, during my introduction, thank you so much for that. I, I love the, the um, intertidal area. And on Elliott Key, there's a lot of time to just walk along that shore. Um, it's the, long, the largest island in the national park. It's about seven miles long and about three quarters of a mile wide. And it is covered mostly with hardwood hammock, but the edges um, give you an opportunity to see what the tide brought in. And sometimes there's lobster um, uh, molts, there's um, bristle worms, um, sea stars, sea urchins, chitons, and, and it, every day is a discovery because you're not sure what the tide's gonna bring in. Probably one of uh, my favorite parts about visiting these parks is you get to see something different every time you go, whether you go in the morning, the afternoon, right in the afternoon, just about every hour, there's something something different to look out for. And uh, one of my favorites is to look out for, you know, small signs of like coral reefs in the area. I think this will be a really interesting um, topic to kind of get into. And I know you have something prepared for that, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, coral reefs, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the coral reef in Biscayne is our crowning jewel. Um, most uh, folks that visit the park do want to go out and, and see the coral reef. We protect part of the third largest coral reef system in the world. You can see some um, pictures there of our coral reef. It is second only to the rainforest and biodiversity and the number of species that you can find um, at the reef. And it is the most diverse uh, marine ecosystem of all. And it's estimated that about one quarter of all ocean species depend on coral reefs for food or shelter, for and shelter. And that's a really unique um, statistic because there is um, coral reefs only cover, cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface. Um, in Biscayne, we have about 28 miles or, or so of, of this coral reef. And it's pretty modern day coral reef. Um, and you can see this, one of the pictures here in the center has this little animal related to a sea anemone um, and um, jellyfish. They're called coral polyps. And they are the true architects of the reef. Um, the reef building corals like we have in Biscayne are found only in, in shallow and tropical or subtropical water um, around the world. And um, they are um, incredibly diverse, as I mentioned. We have um, shrimp and lobster and invertebrates and fish, blue tangs and sergeant majors and parrotfish, um, angelfish, just so much. Um, and although we do have this immense diversity there, there are some great threats affecting the um, coral reefs worldwide. And the, the two greatest threats right now are rising water temperatures and ocean acidification. Um, the water temperature is, is a, a big factor. If you look at that little polyp that I pointed out, you'll see that there's some specks in there. And those little specks are a microscopic algae that lives within the tissue of this little animal. And they have a symbiotic relationship where they each benefit the polyp 
the little animal and then the algae, they both benefit from each other. Um, the increase in water temperature is actually um, making the coral polyps um, expel the algae and it's causing um, them to not get um, their primary source of nutrition and that causes coral bleaching. So if you've heard of coral bleaching, that's the phenomenon that's happening. Um, and that's one of the, the threats that's, um, that the rise in, in water temperature is leading to. The other is um, this ocean acidification that you may have heard of as well. And what happens there is that the ocean is becoming more acidic and um, the corals are having a harder time, not just corals, but any um, animal that has a, um, a calcium carbonate skeleton is having a more difficult time creating that skeleton. And if ocean acidification becomes severe enough, it may actually break down already existing corals that are providing structure to the reefs around the world. So bit of a downer, I'm sorry, but there's always hope um, well, let's go ahead and, and see if we have any questions so far. Absolutely. Let's take a look. Um, oh, kind of a personal one for me. So we've mentioned that for coral reefs, they are very important to regulating certain ecosystems, like you may have mentioned, Maria. Um, would it be fair enough to say that if coral reefs go, go away, that we'd have a really hard time keeping up those ecosystems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're they're vital um, to the the world's um, food chain um, and diversity. So so the corals themselves, the, that little animal that creates these structures um, and this habitat. Um, if the corals aren't there, then um, the the ecosystem, the dynamics, the food web would would slowly be begin to crumble and as always we're connected um, to these systems as well. I'm gonna tag team Gary in case he needs he would like to add something to that. Now, well, I mean coral reefs just think about you know the the economic impact on tourism in South Florida, how much food, if you like seafood, you know it's somewhere in the mangrove coral reef area at some point in its life. So there's lots of, of reasons, but they're mainly just like really cool, pretty places for me. They are really cool and pretty places. I think they're some of the, the most precious places that we have here, just because they have such a great diversity of life. And it is an excellent way to showcase how diverse diversity is a great phenomena that makes things just work. And if we want to see those pretty places and the great diversity that it has, we have to protect it. And somebody would like to know what are the National Park Services doing to protect these vital coral reef areas? Well, we, we have a variety of national parks that are specifically set aside to protect reefs. Um, Biscayne, Virgin Islands, um, Virgin Islands Coral Reef National Monument, a whole separate park from what we just described, Buck Island Reef, places in, in Hawaii and American Samoa. So um, we do have these places, but the federal government's role in, in protecting coral reefs has, has often not included the National Park Service. It's included places like the, um, the Hawaiian, Northwest Hawaiian Islands uh, Marine Reserve that we talked about earlier. As far as what we are doing in Biscayne, we, we are we had a long series of public meetings that um, overwhelmingly showed that people wanted to have these areas protected with a no-take zone that still has not been implemented yet, but we are hopeful that that will happen sometime uh, in the near future. So um, yeah, some of those things. And if I may add to that, um, some folks may or may not know that besides being really amazing places to visit, um, national parks are also places where science takes place and research takes place. We have divisions of, of uh, scientists, uh, you know, uh, departments um, where biologists and ecologists are dedicated in, day in and day out. They don't do programs most of the time like we do. They, in Biscayne National Park, 
hop on a boat and they go diving and they spent most of their day underwater and they're inventorying um, and monitoring fish and corals. And one of the most fascinating um, things that was done in the park is that we have um, threatened and endangered corals that are physically too far apart to um, be able to um, uh, reproduce to, to get their, their, their genes crossed. Um, so so they, the scientists are marine biologists and ecologists, um, and many of them are actually students working on their uh, masters or PhDs um, in our local universities. They go out there during the April full moon when these corals are spawning and they actually collect um, the gametes um, from the um, corals and they then put them um, in, in collection bins and tanks so that those corals are able to, um, to fertilize um, across this, this vast space uh, out at the coral reef. And then um, they wait and they wait for, for the polyps to form and, and then they went ahead and put um, them back um, out on the coral reef. So because corals grow so, so slow on an average, just an inch a year, um, and you can see, you know, some of these beautiful um, boulder corals that are much, very large, they took um, um, sometimes dozens, if not hundreds of years to get um, very large beyond my screen. So um, it, it's a process of, of patience and monitoring um, because you have to wait to see if your research and your project is successful. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That is a really good, interesting point that there are a lot of good research going on at, at these national parks. And I think a lot of people would uh, really appreciate if you guys could at some point maybe pop in some good links. I'm sure we can attach that later on. There were some questions about what exactly are other programs that the National Park Service has and also what people can, you know, do from home because not, everyone, not everyone's able to travel. So we want to know how can we help protect oceans at home? Absolutely. Um, there are quite a, a lot of things that we can all do and these um, these issues that these environmental concerns and issues and problems, they seem so large and it seems like, how are we ever going to make a difference? How am I going to make a difference? But we, we really can make a difference um, if we do it together. And, um, you know, we mentioned already being water wise with your fertilizers and your pesticides and choosing non toxic chemicals in your home, um, but also trimming down on trash. That's something that we can do everywhere. Um, ditch the disposable lifestyle. Um, a lot of us are choosing um, um, glass or aluminum or reusing our water bottles and our, our grocery bags. Um, those are really simple things that I, I bet most of us are doing already. Um, garbage patrol you know, don't litter, really basic things, but some of you may go beyond that and may pick up other people's trash when you visit um, shores, lake shores, or even the street, because we talked about those drains already. Um, we have to be fish friendly. Um, see what's going on your plate. Where is it coming from? How was it caught? And, um, and education is a big part of that. Um, choosing your pets carefully. It's, uh, it's very attractive sometimes to get maybe an exotic pet, but those pets get larger and larger. And sometimes we think that it's okay to release them back into the wild, but it's not. Um, and then when we do travel, we want to make sure that we select um, sea friendly souvenirs. Um, so be careful where, what you purchase when you travel and it's not something that's made out of um, an endangered species, for example, a sea turtle shell, or maybe even just a regular shell because um, hermit crabs, they need those in the water. So these little things do make a difference. Um, and then the big one, of course, is cutting our carbon footprint. 
Um, that's a way that we can all slow down um, global climate change and ocean acidification. And again, this seems massive, um, but all of us can do our part. And one of the suggestions that I have for, for kids is doing a, an, a home energy audit um, you can look at your home, look at where you use energy and um, where you want to cut back um, on energy use. And that'll really get you thinking about, um, about where, where it is that you're using energy. And then there's lots of R's, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle, repair, repurpose, refuse. Um, that's a good one. And, um, and then get growing, grow food, plant trees. Um, if, we, um, if we all plant one tree, it's gonna, it's gonna add up. And we have, um, I have a friend actually that started planting one tree in her neighborhood, neighborhood and she's up to 57 trees now. And when she goes to exercise around her neighborhood, she sees all the trees that she's planted. And of course that took um, about seven years for her to plant all those trees. Um, but why not start where you are? And that's uh, what leads me to um, the picture from Rachel Carson. Um, if you may have heard of her, you may know her or admire her dearly as I. She uh, started out like every single person um, on this um, uh, program right now as a nature lover. And then she became a writer, a marine biologist, and then eventually really uh, changed um, the world. And um, my biggest recommendation is to learn about what you're passionate about, because that'll lead you places. Start where you are and then think outside the box um, because the answers are there. It just takes new eyes um, that many of you have because some of us, we've been looking at things the same old way. And if we haven't come up with the solution, it's, it's your turn. Well, thank you so much, Maria. And I think we can go ahead and open it up to some, some questions, see that we got running in here from our sources. Let's see if we got any coming in. Oh, looks like we have one. It says, um, how do the both of you guys plan on spending the, role, the rest of your World Oceans Day? <laughs> that is a great question. I wish I could get out to the ocean. I don't know if that's possible. I honestly, I don't even know if beaches and whatnot are open in my area yet. I, I did, like I said the other day, I celebrated a little bit earlier by going paddle boarding out at Jones Lagoon. But um, yeah, I don't have any, any ocean-y plans for today. That's awful, isn't it? <laughs> On such a today like this. But what about you, Maria? Did you mention you had anything fun today? Well, since um, since I've been put on the spot like this, I think I should definitely plan on going for a paddle um, um, this afternoon. I can see out my window that the palm trees are um, are very still, and my kids have been itching um, at getting in in the water. So I also heard that my husband got home from work already. So I think that might be a, a fun way to celebrate getting into Biscayne Bay and getting some of that, um, that nature therapy, that um, salt water purifying, salt air purifying my lungs. Yeah, that sounds actually a really good plan. I, I got to figure out what I'll be doing with the rest of my World Action Day besides this awesome uh, virtual program with you guys. Um, and on that note, there is one more question before um, we wrap everything up here. And that's going to be, um, are there any resources out there that would help somebody be able to find tide pools in our national park? And you can also add socials into their Gary as well. Um, let's see. Biscayne National Park, we do have tide pools, but our tide pools honestly are not terribly exciting, if I'm being blunt. Um, they're not like if you go to Olympic National Park, you know, where you've got sea stars as big as your head piling on top of each other. We don't have that. Acadia National Park has some great tide pools as well. Um, but Biscayne National Park, our tide pools are pretty cool if you're willing to, to really look down close at the little tiny things, the chitons and the, 
and the little snails and the occasional fish that might get caught in there or something like that. So that would be my best guess for uh, best suggestion for uh, for tide pools. So if you uh, if you're interested in learning more about Biscayne National Park, we are on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter at Biscayne NPS. We have a brand new YouTube channel. It's only been around for a few weeks, so we've got a few things. You'll see Maria and I in there a lot because we've been at home making videos these past few months. Um, so that's Biscayne National Park 1 because somebody else already stole Biscayne National Park. And uh, our website, of course, is nps.gov slash bisque. And if you have any questions, there's a, an email address for you to send them in to. All righty. Let's see. I'm definitely going to have to grab a hold of all of those here in a little bit and make sure I follow up on all those social media platforms that you guys have so graciously provided for us. And um, on behalf of myself, the Earth Echo team as well, the Youth Leadership Council uh, that I'm also a part of, and the rest of our amazing partners and friends all around the world, we would like to thank you so much, Maria, and so much, Gary, for being able to join us here on a great day, World Oceans Day, uh, for helping us out with our virtual program and our virtual tour of the National Park System. And a special thank you uh, that goes straight out to some of our sponsors such as uh, Northrop Grumman Foundation for the support of our expedition, uh, expedition program. And we'd also like to say, be sure to stay connected with Earth Echo on our social media channels. We are having a book giveaway actually, so make sure to subscribe to our channel here and head over to Facebook to learn some more about that if that's still going on. Also stay tuned to earthecho.org to find out more information, just like that energy audit that Maria was talking about. We actually have an energy audit on there so you can start at home and work out that way. So stay tuned to earthecho.org to find out more information about all of our exciting programs, including upcoming virtual events just like this one. And without further ado, we'd like to say thank you again for joining us today. Please stay safe, healthy, and keep exploring. Goodbye, everybody. And happy World Oceans Day. Happy World Oceans Day. Thank you so much.